the way maker. Way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. awesome hearing you all this morning. I like starting with that song. <laughs> Just keep singing out to the Lord this morning. Sing out in your own heart. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions to buy glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how much your affections are for me and oh how he loves us oh like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And all of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory.
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above of every song.
really take this time to worship in our hearts this morning. Separate from our week, separate from our distractions, and fill our life with honesty. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall, but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing.
Jesus is still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. This promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. Still in
pray together. Lord, God, just uh, are gathered here before you this morning and we are in your presence. We know that you are here with us. It's your promise that you made ages ago to your people that you delight to sing over us, that you delight to look upon us, that you go out searching for us, that you think we're fair when we think that we are just covered in filth and ugly and left out to dry. You revive us. You bring us back to your house. You clothe us. You feed us. You call us your children. Lord, thank you for the grace and the mercy, Lord, that you've shown us. I pray that we would be constantly reminded of it, Lord, because it's really easy to lose sight of it as soon as we walk out of here, as soon as we leave the company of other believers or, or as soon as we close your word and move on with our day, teach us to walk with you, walking in your steps. Lord, so that throughout each aspect of our lives, we can see you in small moments and in the big ones, Lord. Lord, we can see your everyday grace and we can see when you really do make miracles, you move mountains, you, you make a way when there's no way, Lord. And in the lives of those in this room right now, I know that that's been happening even this week. You've been opening up hearts to your word, to your gospel. You've been saving family members. You've been pulling people through sickness, You've been bringing new life into the world miraculously, Lord, when maybe there was no hope of it. And we just thank you for these things, Lord, and we bless you even when the miracles don't happen the way we want them to, Lord. When somebody somebody leaves this world unexpectedly or Maybe we've known it for a long time and it's still very difficult. And I just pray that you would give grace to those who are suffering this morning as well, those who are grieving, and those who feel like they don't have a hope to know that you give us the strength to get up tomorrow and to live each day that you've set before us until you call us home. As we hear your word this morning, I pray that you would come visit us, speak to our hearts, open our ears, open our eyes to see new and glorious things about you from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Duncan. Well, good morning. How are we all doing this morning? Good? Amen. You look good. You look good. Welcome to Grace Life Beachside, your refuge by the sea. If this is your first Sunday here, we'd love to get your feedback about your visit today. So... A little navigation station out here where it's got the surfboard. We've got these little cards out there. We'd love to get your feedback today about how you like the service. So uh, give us some feedback on the way out the door today. Y'all ready to dive into God's Word this morning? Y'all ready? All right, let's get it. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. is actually the last sermon in our series called Things Jesus Never Said. So we're going to wrap up Mark chapter 2 today. This is what we read. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, being Jesus, 
Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. We're building suspense here a little bit. Let's go back here. Let's go. There we go. Then he said to them this. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So let's pray together once more. Father, we do, we ask above all, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things from your law. Father, our default instincts are dead wrong. (laughs) We pick up the Bible and we read it with preconceived notions that will damn us. And so apart from a supernatural intervention by your Holy Spirit in our hearts, we won't even get this. We will get offended. We will misunderstand. And so we need, this is above my pay grade, God. It's above my pay grade. And so I humbly ask that you would push me out of the way and open our eyes to see wonderful things from your law. Father, help us to embrace the counterintuitive reality of the gospel. That our only qualification for salvation is the recognition of our unqualification. That the way up is down. That we win by losing. That the quest for righteousness is not satisfied, it's extinguished. As none of us are ever going to be good enough to get in. And so please, Lord, push aside our willpower and our to-do list and help us to receive with meekness the implanted word which can save our souls, the gospel. We pray for that. We also pray for the churches in our hood. Um, Lord, let's lift up, uh, let's lift up identity down in downtown Daytona with Pastor Byron down there. We pray for him, Lord, this morning. Lord, bless his hand, bless his work, bless his family. Protect his family, his wife, his two kids, Lord. Provide for them financially. And Lord, we pray in the near future, you provide a building. There's so many churches closing, Lord. We, that man is full of fight. He's got fire in his belly, Lord. And he loves you. And I pray for identity, Lord, that we'd watch over that church this morning. Bless them and guide them, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. All right, so part three of things Jesus never said. Are we good on the slides this morning, or is that kind of frozen? We're good? Okay, we're good. We're going to venture in here. Um, There is a pastor out in California whose name is Larry Osborne. Maybe, oh, am I live now again? Sweet. Give it a shot, yeah. There we go. Back from the dead, resurrected, right? Here we go. There's a guy named Larry Osborne. Maybe you heard of him. He's a pretty famous guy. Um, he's got a huge church out in, I think it's like San Diego area, God's country. Anyway, um, many years ago, for the surf only, um, <laughs> and the hills, it's got some beautiful mountains, um, but uh, like a few years ago, like a decade ago, his church was full. It just got full, and they ran out of room, so they had a decision to make about what to do. So they decided to start a Saturday night service, and... Um, It made sense. You know, it made sense for a lot of reasons, you know. If they add a Saturday night service, some people on Sunday could go on Saturday night and that open up seats so people could come in and hear the word of God, you know. So that was was a good move. And the second reason they wanted to add a Saturday night service is it's an evangelistic opportunity. Some people work on Sundays. So he said, you know what, if we add a Saturday night service, some folks that may not go to church normally can come to church on Saturday night. So anyway, they had a Saturday night service. Larry does this at his church. 
And um, he gets a letter from one of his longtime members that's very upset about the decision to have a Saturday night service. And the reason is, it was making it too easy for people to go to church. Can't make this stuff up, folks. But anyway, um, so Larry, you know, they sit down, they have lunch, they talk through this guy's uh, issues. And this guy basically said, you know, Sunday is the Lord's Day, which it is, amen, it's called that in the Bible, but we're supposed to go to church on Sundays, and so by having church only on Sundays, we sort of like thin the herd a little bit. You know that terminology? Separate the wheat from the chaff, bro. Got to weed out the uncommitted, right? And so he said, you know, we've got to keep it on Sundays because if you offer on Saturday, you're making it way too easy for folks to come to church, you know? And so he quoted verses about, you know, the gate is narrow and the path is narrow and there's only a few to be saved. Me and my family, we're only going to be going to heaven. You know, he's got all these verses that he's throwing out at Larry about how the, the gate is narrow and it was compromised in introducing worldliness into the church to have a Saturday night service. So, now, this sounds comical a little bit, right? Sounds comical. But I would say this. Our hearts are the exact same way. We're wired to think the same way. The exact same way. There's a, there's a friend of mine. Um, he, he's a pilot, and he's probably one of the biggest evangelists I've ever known. Like, he shares the gospel with everybody. Like, you're, you go with him to Publix, and, you know, you're like, please don't share, please don't share. He's the guy that's just going to, whoever he talks to, he's going to share, you know. And you'll be there for like 45 minutes. But um, anyway, he tells the gospel to everybody that he meets. And he was telling me the story one time about joining a very conservative church. And he was in the membership interview process, and he's telling them, you know, here's my wife, yeah, here's our family, da, da, we're going to join your church, I'm a pilot, so I'll be gone, just letting you know, I'll be gone every other Sunday, I haven't left the faith. And the pastor said to him this, I guess you're going to have to find a new line of work, huh? You think about that, that's our default mode, we think, man, Sunday is the Lord's day. And I tell you what, my heart... As much as I read this and I'm like, that's not me. I know it's me. I, I have preached at churches that have a Saturday night service before. And there's a part of me, just a little bit still, that's like, these folks, man, they just here because they're uncommitted. That's why they're here on Saturday night. They want to go to Disappearing Island tomorrow all day. And that's why they don't come. On. So, like, seriously, I'm like, this is a warm-up sermon. I don't care if I bomb this thing. This is a sermon at B, you know what I'm saying? Like, I've thought that way. You warm up on the Saturday night folks because they're uncommitted. And so our default mode is to, uh, to have a very legalistic view about the Sabbath, about what day to worship on. But the reality is this. God doesn't care what day you worship on. He only cares that you worship. Right? So if you go to Disappearing Island all the time and you ain't never in church, bro, that's a problem. But you don't have to come tell me, like, hey, we're just going to be at Disney next Sunday. We won't be here. And I, I'm not going to, like, freak out and think that you fell away from the faith, Okay? God doesn't care what day you worship on. He only cares that you worship. Like Romans 14 says, one person, this is so good by Paul, one person considers one day more sacred than another. Sunday is the day. Another person considers every day alike. I can worship on Saturday nights. right? Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Paul says, have a conviction, but don't place your convictions on somebody else. That's where legalism comes in. Whether you homeschool or whether you worship on Sunday morning or Saturday night, that's cool. There's liberty there, but don't place your preferences on everybody else. But the Sabbath is one of those areas where a lot of us, we, we're confused. We're not sure wh what to believe, what to do. And so we tend to think that Sunday is the day, and that's it. And that's the reason why we're doing this series called Things Jesus Never Said. It's because that's what our passage is actually about this morning. It's all about the Sabbath and how to keep the Sabbath in the right way and the wrong way. And uh, our hearts are tempted to think that we have to have these certain rules that surround the Sabbath. And we're not, some, some traditions say there's no fun and you can't do this and you can't do that. You can't watch TV, you can't shop. There's a lot of different rules surrounding the Sabbath. And so our default mode is a lot more in line with the Pharisees than with Jesus. It really is. Because the Pharisees, they read the fourth commandment, which says, observe the Sabbath 
and keep it holy. And they read the Ten Commandments, and they read this commandment, and they thought, dude, I, I want to obey this. I so want to keep this. I mean, their intentions were good. They were like, I want to keep this law. And so what they did is they started adding a bunch of extra rules beside this to make sure they kept the Sabbath. Because that's our default mode. Legalism is like Lay's potato chips. You can't eat just one, you know. You've got to add a lot more stuff in there. And so what happened was, is they, they sat back, the Pharisees did, over hundreds of years, and they said, okay, so we're not supposed to, like, we're supposed to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, but what does that mean? We're not supposed to work, God says. So they started getting, like, real nitpicky about what was considered working. Because they said things like, you know what? Um, can we walk? Because walking is a lot of work. And they said things like, can you cook a meal? Because cooking's a lot of work. Can you tie a knot? Because some knot, like a sailor knot, that's a lot of work. You know what I'm saying? I was on a boat this week with Paul, right? There's a, sailor knots are a lot of work. You know, there's a lot there. You can't get it undone. Anyway, they had so redefined and reclarified and helped God out with the fourth commandment that it became this burden to keep it. In fact, just to give you an idea, these are a couple things that I, I discovered in my study. This is some of the Sabbath baloney that the Pharisees added in. These are the rules everybody lived by. They pressed upon them. You couldn't walk more than 1,999 steps. That's because 2,000 steps is a half a mile. A half a mile is work. So you can, because you're on a journey. Anything more than a half mile, you're journeying, bro. You're going, so you're traveling. You're not allowed to travel in the Sabbath. 1,099, right? Couldn't tie your shoes. Couldn't tie your sandals, right? So you had to have palms or whatever, you know, cords or flip-flops, you know. Because that was work. And this is a very interesting one. This one was actually fascinating to read about. You couldn't defend yourself on the Sabbath because fighting back is work. So all the enemies of Israel knew this, and that's why they would attack on the Sabbath. They were like, where should we attack? And they were like, Saturday, let's hit them up, you know? Because they couldn't fight back. You couldn't even defend yourself. And so the Pharisees, they had all these rules and Maybe the weirdest one of all was this. You had to be careful even where you spit on the Sabbath. Like you, you could spit on a rock, but you couldn't spit on sand. Because spit and sand make mud, and mud is too close to concrete, and concrete is building material, right? I, ain't, I, ain't ma- I wish I was making this up. I'm not. Y'all are like, he's making some. I ain't making it up, bro. That's why I'm pasty white. I study all week. You know what I'm saying? Like seriously. I'm up in the books. Um, yeah, they, they, you couldn't spit on the ground. You had to make it where you spit. You're like, and that's why when you read the Gospel of John, Jesus healed a guy with mud in his eyes. Remember that? It's kind of weird. You know, Jesus walks up, the guy's blind, and Jesus spits on the ground, makes mud, and mashes it in the dude's eye sockets. And you're like, that's kind of gross, man. And you're like, did Jesus have like a bet with the apostles? Like, hey, Peter, check this out. Ten bucks says I can hawk a loogie and this guy will bless me for it, right? <laughs> it's okay, Don. <laughs> anyway, no, we read stuff in the scripture like, why? seriously, I ask questions of the Bible. When I, when I read the Bible, I ask questions. Why did it say this? And not, that's just how I am. I'm weird, analytical. Why, does it, why didn't you just speak to the guy's eyes? It would be a lot easier. If I'm the blind guy, I don't want you spitting and mashing that into my eye sockets, you know? Why did he do it, though? Because Jesus was defying the religious baloney of the Pharisees. That's why he spits in the sand. He's like, this is cool, bro. This ain't a big deal. Anyway, that was for free. Now you can take that to work tomorrow and persecute all your coworkers with that Bible nugget, right? Anyway, that's why Jesus spit. Anyway, so Jesus never broke the law. Let me get clear here. He never broke the law, but he did break the religious funk of the Pharisees. He wasn't a pushover. He wasn't like, all right, whatever you think, guys. No, he was, Jesus did not allow legalists to jerk people around. We're going to especially see that in the next chapter. Jesus had a chippy side to him at times. I kind of like it because I'm an Enneagram 8. I'm like, that's pretty cool, man. Um, But uh, he didn't let people get jerked around. And so what happened was our our passage this morning is an example of Jesus once again standing up to the Pharisees. This is what we read. This is what we read. Check this out. One Sabbath, Jesus' disciples walking through grain fields. 
his disciples are walking along, they pick a little bit, and then they're eating it, right? And the Pharisees said to him, look, what you're doing is not lawful on the Sabbath. So maybe you've heard this before explained, but, you know, when you're picking heads of grain, you've got to rub it between your fingers and you can munch on it a little bit. So I know sunflower seeds are a lot better, I think. But, I mean, you can kind of you can rub them between your fingers and you can eat the grain because you're hungry. So the Pharisees are like, no, you can't do that. You can't separate the wheat from the chaff. That's too much work. So, like, they're hiding in the bushes to find fault. Now, what does Jesus do? He yodas them. As always, Jesus yodas them. He drops a Bible. This is like a Bible bomb. This is so good. Check this out. This is a nugget and a half. He says this, bro. He says, would you like to allow the smart device on this TV? (laughs) Uh, He answered this. Have you ever read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need in the days of Abiathar the high priest? He's even like telling them what time it happens to make sure they know. And listen, they they memorized the Old Testament. They knew this. This was a shot. This was a dig. Have you never read the Bible, bro? When he entered the temple, the house of God, he entered the temple. David did. He's not a priest. And he ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he gave it to some of his companions. Whoa, Nelly. This is a big, big deal here. They're finding fault with Jesus and his disciples for eating on the Sabbath and working a little bit. And Jesus is like, have you never read in the Old Testament where David did this? How about that, huh? So what he's referencing is this. It's cool. It happens, you know, to the best of us. Um, (laughs) It happens all the time. But what happens is this. So David is running from Saul. Saul wants to kill him. David and Saul, if you read... First Samuel, they have Biggie Tupac type drama. They're always going at it, bro. We're, it's more Saul than David, really. So anyway, um, David's just running. So I don't know what that would you call that. But he's running for his life. He's got all his buddies. And so they're famished. They haven't had time to stop and eat. So they go to a city called Nob. And when they go to Nob, they go to the temple there. They get the priest there. And David's like, bro, we are so hungry, Abiathar. We, I, we need some food here, bro. We need something to eat. And they say this. We don't have any food here. All we have is the priestly bread that only the priest can eat. And what he's talking about is this. Um, In the Old Testament, the priests were not only butchers, they were also bakers and probably candlestick makers, right? (laughs) Wasn't in there, but that was for free. Um, But what happened was this. They not only killed animals, they would bake bread. They'd bake bread once a week. What they would do is they'd take 12 loaves of bread they made, Each one for each of the tribes of Israel, right? Twelve tribes, twelve loaves of bread. They would take those bread in to before like the throne where like the um, ark is and stuff. And they'd put it on a table there. And they would leave the bread like in the presence of God for seven full days. It was like, it was called the show bread. Like the bread of the presence. It was a really holy bread. So they'd bake fresh bread, put it in there. And then after a week, they'd bake some more loaves. That's what they're doing here, swapping it out. They're getting the old loaves and getting the new loaves. And they're putting the new stuff in, taking the old stuff out. After they take out the old bread, weak old bread, they get to eat it. Only the priest can eat it, though. Nobody else. That's the law. So, this is a big deal because David is not a priest again. He's not even a king yet. This is pre-king. So, what happens is, is that David and his friends eat this holy bread that's only for the priest that's been in God's presence. It's clearly violating what it says in the Old Testament. And so Jesus says, "Um, remember this? How about that? And I'm sure, like, there must have been, like, smoke coming out of the Pharisees' ears. Because this this is like a serious Bible knot, bro. Because they're trying to grapple with what Jesus is saying. Because you think about it. God says this bread is only to be eaten by the priest. God said it. And yet... You read this text and you're like, how come David, God didn't kill David? He's not supposed to eat that. How come God didn't kill the priest for giving him the bread? Why is that? It's a very good question, isn't it? You guys are curious yet? Well, the answer is, Jesus is actually going to give us the answer. This is the reason why God didn't kill David for eating the bread. Because, he's going to give us the answer, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. 
he is reminding the Pharisees of the true intention of God's law. The law, this is really the, the, the nugget, the main idea here that, that we're trying to get after. The main idea Jesus is saying is this. The law was given to serve man, not the other way around. Y'all missed your shout moment there. That should have been like a, that was a Baptist amen. Mmm. Mmm. We don't say amen. Mmm. Oh, that was good. Um, The law was given to serve man, not the other way around. This is really profound. The law, Ten Commandments, the Sabbath, the bread and the presence, all that was meant to serve. It was supposed to be a blessing for man. The law was never meant to be a burden for man, ever. And so, you know, God didn't create the Sabbath first in history and then make a man to come and serve the Sabbath and obey the Sabbath. You guys following me so far? God creates man first, and then he creates law, right? He gives law afterwards that are meant to help the man. They're they're meant to serve man. The law was meant to serve man, not the other way around. And so the Sabbath, when it's understood correctly is not meant to create human need. It's meant to satisfy it. The Sabbath is meant to make man happy, make man healthy. It's not meant meant to make man sicker. He can't defend himself, can't eat, can't go to the hospital, can't do anything. When you so redefine the law that you turn it from a blessing into a burden, you've whiffed on the point of the law. And so the reason that the priest, without even asking anybody, they didn't even pray about it, it says. They just gave David the bread. Why is that? Because the priest understood these laws are meant for our good. These laws aren't like arbitrary things by a God up in heaven saying, hey, do this and then do that. And then, hey, it sucks to be you. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, and do that. Because we tend to think that way about God's law. Like it's some arbitrary thing, some God up in heaven with making silly rules that don't apply to anything. No, the law was meant to serve us. The Sabbath was made for man, not a man for the Sabbath. And so this is a huge, huge takeaway here. And so the Sabbath really was misunderstood by the Pharisees, and I think it's misunderstood by us today. We don't understand the Sabbath. I see people talking about this is the day of the Lord, and they get all legalistic, and I'm like, bro, you're whiffing on the whole point of the law. Because the Sabbath is basically a warning against materialism and idolatry. You know what the Sabbath really is? It's God commanding you to take a day off, So that you don't try to overwork and make a lot of money and keep up with the Joneses. Because the Joneses ain't happening anyway, bro. That's what it's all about. It's not about like observing certain rules. It's about, bro, don't find your life and how much you work and how much money you got and how big your bins is. Because it ain't going to make you happy. So check out the fourth commandment, actually, in its entirety. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Um, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, or your son, or your daughter. Don't teach them to overwork, right? Take a break. Your male servants, your female servants, your livestock, I mean, don't drive them excessively. Um, people within your gate, listen, for God did everything in six days, and he took a break, so you can too. This is the point of the Sabbath. And so again, we've got to keep this in the back of our mind because what Jesus is saying is that if you try to take this law and turn it into some like hyper-vigilant burden on people, you're missing the whole point of the law. This is meant to free you, not to enslave you. And so the Sabbath commandment is all about, this command is all about discouraging people from worldliness. From just, you're overworking, you're working seven days a week, you got your job, and then your side hustle, and then your other side hustle. And that's all you do is work. And so, the Sabbath was meant to uh, protect you. And again, thank you, Duncan. This is such a, uh, such a huge, huge deal here, because our default mode is legalism. We've talked about that. Not only that, but like, we live in a, we live in a country where our roots, gang... Our roots are very moralistic and legalistic. They just are. When you think about it, our founding fathers are, the, are these guys, the pilgrims. And who were the pilgrims? They were folks who didn't like what was going on at their old church in England. 
So they left their church in England and they came here to start a new... America is the result of a church split, okay? I don't know how to say any clearer than that. They didn't like the way things were going at their old church. It wasn't pure enough. It wasn't clear enough. It wasn't doctrinal enough. It wasn't whatever enough. And so they decided to start their own church, which happens. So they moved to America and they're like, we're going to start our own church and do it the right way. And so that's what happened. So they came here and these are our founding fathers. And our, this is our DNA of our country, bro. It was started by um, really, really puritanical people called pilgrims who would like at times burn witches and drown people. And nobody's perfect, I know, but they were very, very, <laughs> they were very, very zealous about their religion. We got to do it right. We got to do it right. In fact, uh, one of the pilgrims, uh, his name was uh, Cotton Mather. He had a son named Nathaniel Mather. Nathaniel Mather was uh, like 16. He wrote this in his diary. This is a pilgrim boy. I feel so bad for him. When I was young, I went astray from God. Oh, what, what happened, dude? Vegas? No. And one of the manifold sins of which I was guilty, none so haunts me as this one. One day I was whittling on the Sabbath. Oh. And of fear of being seen, I hid behind a door while I did it. This was a great reproach of God and a specimen of that atheism that I brought into the world with me. Damn. Some of y'all are like, I wish I could trade my kids' problems for this kid's problem. <laughs> I, take, I take whittling over a lot of things. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Dad comes in, throws a mattress, a bunch of sticks under there, whittled, you know. Anyway, that was for free. Anyway, um, but whether we realize it or not, this is, our, this is our default mode. It's okay. This is our default mode, is legalism. And so what is the Sabbath about? The Sabbath is meant to protect you, not from whittling. But from overworking, working yourself into an early grave, working yourself into debt, working yourself into a situation where you're not human anymore. All you are, you're a widget, bro. All you do is go to work. All you are is on. That's all you are. For example, Erin uh, Kalan, she was, uh, she was the former CFO of Lehman Brothers before it crashed. She was at one time known as the most powerful woman on Wall Street. So she's the CEO, and... Um, her life was basically her work. That's all she did was work. And she said this. She said, I didn't start out with the goal of devoting all of myself to my job. It just crept in over time. Each year that went by, slight modifications became the new normal. At first, I spent a half an hour on Sunday organizing my email, my to-do list, and calendar to make Monday morning easier. Then, I was working a few hours on Sunday. Then, all day on Sunday. My boundaries slipped away until work was all I had left. I had relationships, a spouse, friends, and a family, but none of them got the best version of me. They all got what was left over. So that's that's Aaron. She's the big wig on Wall Street. C, she's actually, excuse me, CFO of Lehman Brothers. So she's she's this huge, huge big wig. What happens though? Her life is just her work. It just slips away. Everybody else gets leftovers. And so what happened was this. Um, her identity became her work. That's the whole point of the fourth commandment. Don't make your work your identity. That's not your life, bro. But that's what happened. And so when, um, when Lehman Brothers went out of business in 2008, when we had the big crash in here in America, she was devastated. She said this, when I lost my job, it devastated me. I couldn't just rally and move on. I did not know how to value who I was versus what I did. What I did was who I was. See that? Her identity was her work. And so the sudden loss of her job devastated her, wrecked her. That's the whole point of the warning in the fourth commandment of the Sabbath. Don't make your work your life because you're greedy or whatever it is. It's going to end in heartache. And um, when the market crashed and everything crashed in 2008, it actually it proved to be a silver lining because... Um, this is what she wrote after the crash. She said, I have spent the last several years living a very different version of my life where I try to apply my energy to my new husband, Anthony, and the people who I love and care about. She said this, but I can't make up for lost time. Most importantly, although I now have stepchildren, I missed having my own kids. I'm 47 and Anthony and I have been trying in vitro fertilization for years. Nothing's happened yet and we're still hoping. I mean, you read this, you're like, your heart goes out to her because you're like, you can see yourself getting sucked up in this, where your whole life just goes by you. 
And when you think about the fourth commandment, don't think about God up in heaven just making up rules for no reason. Think about God up in heaven saying, I don't want this to be you. I don't want you to put yourself in an early grave or burn yourself out. So this is the reason why, this is the heart of the reason why Jesus says to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's meant for us to be able to relax a little bit and to, uh, to escape from the daily grind. And, and this really, this is the overarching principle for all three of these passages in Mark chapter 2. They really are. It's all about how do you view the law? How do you look at it? When you pick the Bible up and you read, how do you view the law? Do you view the law as something that God made you, made for you to be happy? Or do you view it as something that's like, well, no, I'm not doing that, and and that's a burden there, and that's that's a lot of work. I mean, because the law was given for man, as Thomas Watson said, to make us happy. God has no other design upon us but to make us happy. He's not trying to frustrate us, you know. It's When he says, like, do not commit adultery, he, he's not trying to frustrate you. You know, God's not trying to put boundaries around your, your life, you know. God's not against shacking up, you know. It's, it's his idea. He's the one that invented it. So um, do not commit adultery is not about a prudish God in heaven that just hates anything that's fun. The reason it says that is this. Divorce is a gut-wrencher. I mean, when you live across the street from folks that are getting divorced and their 13-year-old son comes over to you when he gets off the school bus and bawls his eyes out, it kind of puts into perspective a little better why God says, I hate divorce, do not commit adultery. It, it helps you understand the law is meant for our good. It's not meant to jack you up. It's meant to free you up. But so often I think we come to the Bible and our default mode is, I've got to keep this legalistic this is not actually good enough i gotta this has to be a little more robust here and so we try to add to it and we tend to think that the law if we obey it it's like this like god's the killjoy last week we talked about god, god's this cosmic killjoy who's given us all these rules that are just arbitrary and they don't make a difference and they don't matter and it's almost like we view breaking the law as really living you know it's like it's like you know, you're hanging out with your buddy, and your buddy smokes, and he's like, hey, man, want a cigarette? And you're like, no, nah, I really shouldn't. And he goes, come on, dude, live a little. Have a smoke. What's he implying? He's implying that by breaking the rules, you're living, because we're not meant to breathe in smoke but oxygen, right? Nobody really knows that, I guess. <laughs> yeah. It's the laws of nature. You're not supposed to puff on smoke all day. It ain't good for you. That's why you get cancer. But we think, come on, man, live a little. Life comes from breaking the rules. And we think the same thing with the Bible. We, our default mode is this. We tend to view Christianity like a funnel. You know, you start up here and you get to know God and you're all over the place. And then, but the more you follow God, the more constrained it gets, right? You got to do this and the hair off the ears and wear a top hat and a monocle and have a cane and a suit at all times. You know, you have to, you got to dress up for God. You got to throw away your Bon Jovi records. You know, you got all this stuff where you're getting, fur- we threw away so much good music when we got saved. Well, we, we, you know... We did, and we had to go back and buy it on iTunes. Anyway, so you, you start off, and you're like, you, you're getting more and more and more hammed in. You're getting more and more unhuman. I got to give up this. I can't spit on the ground, you know? That's how we view religion, is like this. The reality is this. This is how the funnel actually looks. You start here, and then the more you walk with Jesus, and the more you understand why God commands what he commands, you're like, oh my gosh, I, this is freeing. So liberating. That's why God said that. God actually makes sense. Oh my goodness, you know? Doesn't it blow you away when things that God say, says make sense? God's logical. And yet we, th- we have this view. We have this view almost like if you're going to live a, like the Christian life, you've got all these extra rules that you've got to follow, and it's, you're basically becoming unhuman. You know, we even sing songs about it, you know, like some of our old hymns. Um, we view sanctification, which is basically like we view the path of becoming holy as somehow becoming less human, not more human. And, and we sing it. This is, this is how the song goes. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. 
and I know that comes right out of Jeremiah and they made a hymn out of it and I get it. But if you interpret that as we're on the wheel and God is mashing us into something we don't want to be, you're missing the whole point of the law. The law is not meant to make you deformed. It's meant to make you beautiful and human. It's not like, all right, I'm chained to the wheel, Lord. Mash me around, you know. I hate this whole thing. You know what I'm saying? We think that, though, don't we? Amen? We think that way about God's law. We're coming here, and this, this is so boring. All the fun stuff's out there, you know what I'm saying? Like, like somehow what God wants us to do is bad for us and unpleasant and unhuman. But the law is not about subjugation. The law is about liberation. That's why James 1 says the law that leads to what? You guys read it? The perfect law that leads to the clicker working. There it is. <laughs> Freedom, right? Freedom. You ever read that and you're like, what in the world is James talking about? The perfect law that leads to freedom? Again, he's pointing out the point of the Ten Commandments. The point of the law is to free you. To free you up. Not jam you up. That's what the law is about. And so when you read the Bible, and maybe like you're back in Proverbs and you're, you know, you're doing a proverb a day or whatever, which is awesome to do. And you read about like the fool, the guy that's the fool. He's the guy that never listens. He's always, he's rebelling, doesn't follow God, doesn't want to follow God. And it calls him the fool. And we think, yeah, he's a fool because God's going to get him. Like, you're a fool, dude, because God is going to, he's going to, there's going to be a huge whammy on you, bro. But listen, if you, if you reject God and you blow him off and you're the fool, yeah, there's going to be consequences. But the reason he's called the fool is because he's rejecting the wisdom and the blessing of living life the way that god intends you to live your life that's what the law is about you know when it says the law brings freedom this is basically what it's saying it's saying this when you when you keep ten commandments life tends to work better not that we keep them perfectly but when we strive to keep god's law life works better the bible is basically saying james is saying everybody's saying jesus is saying if you try to obey God's law and live it God's way, you don't have to drink a 12-pack to get to sleep at night. You just don't. Things just flow. It's not a funnel. It's not, oh, man, this is the worst decision I've ever made, becoming a Christian, you know? It, no, there's liberty, there's joy, there's peace. Our sins are forgiven. Oh, my goodness. Let's shout up in here this morning. You know what I'm saying? We're coming here to once again be reminded it's finished. It ain't riding on us. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, the, the law was given for human flourishing. It's not meant to make you a slave. That's what Jesus is trying to say. Because Jesus knows our default mode. The reason this is in the Bible about fasting and about the Sabbath and about separation is because our default mode is to go the wrong way. And God knows that. And so he's like, listen, here's the real point of the Sabbath, bro. Because we tend to view God's up in heaven and he's got a Napoleon complex. He's an insecure God. He's about four foot, and he's like, I'm going to keep everybody here under my thumb, you know, and you're going to do what I say, right? And that's how we view it. That's not the reality, though. That's not the reality. The reality is God loves us. He gave us the law because he loves us, and if you strive to keep the law, your life will work a lot better, I promise you. I promise you. So the law is given for our good. But the reason this is in the Bible is because Jesus wants us not to view God as the mean, angry ogre in the sky with a Napoleon complex. He wants to free us from any fear-based obeying. Well, I better do that or else I'm going to get whipped. Not because it's good for me or I love it. I just better do it. Because here's the deal. Jesus wants to change our minds about the law because he knows fear-based obedience eventually leads to God-loathing rebellion. People who do all this out of fear do not last. I have done this a long time. They don't make it. If you view it as like this really distasteful thing and I'm on the wheel and just mash me around, it, it's going to be a matter of time. Because here's the deal. I'll, I'll put this quote in, in shoe leather a little easier. Um, today's legalist is tomorrow's atheist. Today's legalist is tomorrow's atheist. Today's Bible thumper is tomorrow's church avoider. And this is so, so important. The reason why Jesus is taking such a firm stand against the Pharisees is he wants us not to get sucked into the rules for rules sake, to see it as a relationship with God. And so this is our default mode. 
and we've got we've got to we've got to get free of it, you know. And here's the deal. If we can begin to view the law once again as something that's for our good and it's for our blessing, and it's not a burden. It's going to make us like addicted to church. It's going to make us addicted to God. We're not going to be able to keep away from God. In fact, if somebody, if you're here this morning, you got burned in church, and now you're back again, giving us a second shot. Um, it's probably not my best sermon. I'm sorry about that. But, um, but I would say this. The number one thing is this, to realize that God loves you, and the commandments are they're for your good and your blessing. I'm sorry if they were used in a way the Bible was used as a bazooka on you. I'm sorry if that happened. But if we can begin to once again trust the heart of God and think, man, he gave this for a reason. He's got good reasons. This is for my, my blessing, my joy. It'll, it'll be a game changer, I promise you. Because that's what happened in the life of Pete Holmes. Pete Holmes is the HBO comedian. Pete Holmes raised in a conservative Christian home. He was even a missionary for a season. Went off and did some missions when he was younger. And then he got older and... Um, like what happens a lot of times, you know, raising a Christian conservative home and then when they get older, you, they sometimes they wander. You don't find them in church. And so what happened is he starts doing stand-up comedy for a living and he falls into atheism. He's no longer a believer. And um, the way that he found his way back to church and back to God was so interesting. It was through the morality and the compassion of his atheistic friends. Yeah, this is the strangest presentation of the gospel I've ever heard before, but grows up Christian, conservative, leaves the church, becomes an atheist comic, finds his way back to God through the morality and compassion of his atheistic friends. And so he tells the story, he and two of his buddies, these guys are atheists, they didn't, they're not churchgoers, they grew up in church, they're traveling together. And they're at a hotel staying overnight, and it's like 2 in the morning, and they're in one of those little mini-marts where, like, everything is like $87. You know what I'm talking about? Like a thing of Oreos or whatever. They're in this little mini-mart in a hotel, and the lady leaves to go get a smoke or the bathroom or whatever. So they're all alone, bro, 2 in the morning, him and these two other comics. So he's like, hey, man. He's like, dude. He's like, we're all alone. Let's steal stuff. And his, one of his buddies goes, dude, no, let's not steal stuff. And then he says this, he goes, but why? This is what he said. If there's no God, and when we die, it's just lights out, party's over, then why don't we just grab some stuff? Because I really want some peanut M&Ms. But his, listen, his friend rebuked him. His atheistic friend rebuked him. He says this. He says, dude, I don't want to steal because we're doing it for one another, man. It's not to please some God somewhere who's mad at you when you steal M&Ms. We're doing it so the woman who's not the counter right now doesn't get fired when they count the M&Ms in cash at the end of inventory. That's pretty stinking cool, ain't it? And this is what Pete Holmes said about this encounter. Think of it. He gets rebuked. But again, fear-based obedience leads to let's steal M&Ms. Um, that experience hit me hard and really changed the way I thought about God and religion because I started to see you didn't need a fear-based model to be beautifully compassionate and kind to others. Isn't that good? Gosh, if we could just work this into our heart. And so for the first time, it like hit Pete Holmes. He's like, dude, he's like, I was taught from a young age not to steal. But it was sort of like, don't steal because I'm the, the game whack-a-mole. I'm the mole. And God's got the mallet. You know what I'm saying? And he's like, don't steal because God's going to get you. And he's like, no, don't steal. Because not stealing is being human. Like, this is what it means to be a human being. We love others, and we care about them, and we do what's right. Not because we have to, but because it's good for us. It's good for others. So anyway, this was actually the means that led him back to church, back to God, and now he's back in church and he's a believer again. But I love the story because this is the reason passages like this are in the Bible. Our default mode is to have a fear-based view of an of a law that makes no sense, that God's just arbitrarily handing down, and yet the law of God is beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. There's so much wisdom in God's law. And so if you're someone who, uh, who tends to, to view God as like the divine dictator, I want you to know this morning, he loves you. And I want you to know this too. We all strive to keep the law, those of us that love Jesus. But listen, nobody, we know we're not perfect, right? But Jesus died on the cross 
for all the times we fall short of keeping the law. God gave us the law and said, hey, if you do this, life's going to work better. And we're like, thanks, bro, no thanks, right? And Jesus came down, died on the cross, and said, listen, I gave it to you to bless you, and now I'm going to double bless you again by dying on the cross. So every time that you didn't keep this, it's been covered, it's under the blood. So if you've come this morning and you're getting rid of a religious funk and baloney, the biggest thing to know is that God loves you. He's for you. So, Amen. We love you too. Thanks for coming. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord. And Father, forgive me if anybody stumbled when I mentioned that about the, the kid whittling and added my own little Jeff in there. But uh, Lord, we, we, all, we all stumble in many ways. Give us grace and mercy, Lord, today, and um, continue to watch over our country, Lord. Please help our, our country to be united, especially during this, uh, this election season. And help us all just to serve one another, love one another, and, um, and be devoted to one another, Lord. And help us, most importantly, to view your law as a blessing, not a burden. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to um, have a time of reflection now. If you want to give, you can give on the way out. There's a big basket out there, or you can jump on your phone right quick. And um, there's ways to give online, I think, so.
Let's say our charge together as we go out this morning and uh, leave just a really good time of worship. And thank you for that message, Jeff. That was really good. Say this with me. I am a witness. I have been called to my neighbors. <laughs> called to my neighborhood. Called to minister to my neighborhood in both word and deed. God has given me his word to equip me, his spirit to empower me, and his love to motivate me. I pledge my life for the gospel. Amen. See you guys next week.